scares me every time he does that. The story of the hurricane research balloon, or what we refer to as Herbie, how that came to be, is very interesting. And in fact, the whole thing is quite by accident. So I had known Mark for a few years, and he knew I was into model airplanes, the radio control type. And one day I took my wife's real expensive little point and shoot camera, little Nikon, strapped it to the wing of the airplane. All right, here we go. Hopefully we don't destroy our camera. Not be pleased. This is a little foam airplane now. Uh, I flew it, flew it around the neighborhood, and I sent Mark the video. Well, a big light bulb went off in his head, and as they say, the rest is history. I knew that we somehow had to take advantage of this. Commercial drones were not quite available yet, and I knew that we had to make this work to our advantage as a way to capture aerial video in the aftermath of a hurricane. So in spring of 2011, Mark flew me out to North Carolina and we were going to test this special airplane that we built for the purpose of aerial photography after a hurricane, that kind of thing. We started testing using a GoPro, literally rubber banded to the nose of the airplane. After the initial testing that we had accomplished along the North Carolina Outer Banks, I knew that I wanted to do even more testing, this time along the coast of Texas. I decided to recruit my good friend Greg Nordstrom from Mississippi State University, as well as one of our crowdfunding partners, Kerry Mallory from the Houston, Texas area. We have a shared passion for weather. We both love it. We both have a passion for it. It's something I've always said as a teacher, you can't teach passion. Either people have it or they don't. And this is something I could see in Mark right away, and not only in how hard he worked, but how he was just as a person. Oh, you can edit this film, this video, right? Yeah. We'll okay, here we, okay, here we go. Here we go, guys. Hello, Mark's out of HurricaneTrack.com, and this is flight test number one from Gilchrist, oh. Texas. Every time we put the plane up and then took a look at the GoPro footage afterwards, we were just stunned at what we saw. And we knew right then and there that this was going to be a big game changer. It went really well, but little did I know it would lead to the birth of the Herbie Project. I was on my way back home to North Carolina after completing the testing in Texas, and I was talking on the phone with my good friend and colleague from the Cyclone Research Group, Tim Millar, telling him all about the successes that we had. and. The fact that I thought that we could maybe even fly the model airplane around in the eye of a hurricane at some point in time to capture some amazing video that way. And he mentioned, well, why don't you guys just attach a GoPro and whatever else you want to some kind of a payload and just launch the whole thing up through the eye of a hurricane to the stratosphere. 
That was the moment. It was all Tim's idea and we ran with it. Over the course of the next year, I began funding the project and also began building the prototype payload. You know, it was crude. It uh, certainly wasn't high tech looking at all. It looked like some high school science project. Test launches of the Herbie project have always been exciting and fun. It's, we're adults, I mean, we're doing some serious science, um, but it's like being a kid again doing a school project. It's just, it's just fun. It's good. All right, hello, Mark Suttoth here. Getting ready to fill up the balloon. We have Carrie helping out. And Ray here will help us and David if we need it. And the idea is to get it inflated and then get it tied, nice and secure, and then hopefully off it goes. The premise behind it is basically we have a balloon, just like a, a, you know, a balloon launch in the National Weather Service but we have equipment with it. You know, we have especially cameras and, and uh, GPS and other instruments on it to record some weather observations. Hey, let's put this together, use common sense, use some logic, and let's just see what happens. Here we go. Well, the first attempt uh, failed. It didn't launch like we hoped it would. I think it was too heavy. Uh, so we decided, well, we have more helium in the tank. Let's untie the balloon, regroup, put more helium in, and see what happens then. I can still see it, still got it. In addition to documenting this momentous occasion, Greg was keeping an eye on the top of the balloon, which was supposed to flatten out more and more as helium was added. And once it flattened out enough, we presumed, presumed that we had enough helium to finally get this thing off the ground. Give it another 10 seconds or so. After working to add more helium to the balloon, we were very careful with how we did it. We tied everything back off again, got everything ready to go, and we were ready to give this a second attempt. Now, I was very nervous. I thought this is probably going to fail in spectacular fashion. We had a TV crew there from a local station out of Waco that was doing a story on this. And I thought, you know, this is really going to be bad if it fails. Luckily, I was wrong. It feels like it. County Road 691 here in Texas, looking for the Herbie payload. Greg over here getting kind of weary like I am. End of the day, man, a lot of stress trying to get it. This is the road where the balloon landed. You can see on the GPS, it is right there. Hold on, let me get my, it's right there. And we are 
right here. Got it! Straight south. Nice. Carrie found it! Nice. I see it! Yeah! Well, here it is. We found it. Carrie's the one that spotted it. Absolutely. We have not touched it yet. There's the parachute. Here's the balloon. All four GoPro cameras doing just fine. Greg, if you want to turn it over for us. At the end of that first test of Herbie, we were all relieved as well as very excited. It was like a bunch of children on Christmas Day celebrating all the presents that they had opened. You know, we were all scientists. We were all high school science project designers at this point in time. You know what I mean? It was just a really fulfilling experience. The teamwork involved, not only for those of us in the field, but the people that helped to crowdfund it, to help, you know, put it together with their ideas. And it was very successful this little ragtag team, we did it. And we were ready to move on to the next phase, and that was to eventually launch this in the eye of a hurricane. The uh, CNN project, Jaeger, I think they called it, that was interesting. The Jaeger project, yeah, uh, so let me explain. CNN wanted to do a story about high altitude ballooning as a hobby. They were doing this with their CNN International students and asked me to be a consultant on the project. I agreed to help if they would allow me to piggyback a couple of additional experiments that we wanted to run with their project. And they said, sure. And so Carrie and I joined the CNN crew in Peachtree City, Georgia for quite a memorable day. We had a tough lesson in high altitude ballooning, that's for sure. Something was going wrong, we just didn't know it yet. All we knew at the time was that the balloon burst way too soon. It was supposed to make it to 100,000 feet. Instead, it reached a burst altitude of only 66,000 feet. Come to find out once we recovered the payload, or more appropriately, the wreckage, that it was a problem with the way the payload was listing back and forth kind of like a pendulum, and this ultimately sealed its doom. The winds in this particular launch were a lot stronger than the first launch, which caused the camera to sway violently along with the payload. This was putting stress on the neck of the balloon as well as where the cords connected to the payload as the payload swung up, slapped and developed, and then it came back down, tightening the string back out. It was only a matter of time before this tightening of the string and the putting the stress on the balloon and the payload caused one or the other to give out. Usually, it is the balloon itself that gives out, tearing where the neck and the actual balloon material meet. However, in this particular case, it was a little more spectacular. It was like something out of a space disaster movie. The payload completely disintegrated. The balloon went off in one direction with the spot locator. The APRS transmitter and the GoPros and the bulk of the payload fell back to earth relatively intact. Carrie and I finally coming across the wreckage several months later. What do you got there, Carrie? We're bringing Jaeger home. We've got all the remnants. The bottom, the top of the cooler. So it was mostly intact. Yes, sir. Two GoPros, both uh, CNN, though uh, the birds look like they used part of the van for a nest. So the payload and the APRS transmitter and all the GoPros fell back to earth and landed in the woods not far from Griffin, Georgia. It took Carrie and I several months of trying to figure things out finally going back in December of 2012 to locate everything. And it really helped us to solve the problem, to understand exactly what happened, why it happened, and it served as a valuable lesson that definitely helped us in the future.
had the opportunity to launch in the eye of Hurricane Nate in October 2017 as it made landfall along the coast of Mississippi. Now the problem was it was in the middle of the night, midnight, 1 a.m., somewhere around there, but we didn't care. We just, we knew this was going to be the last opportunity of the season, so we might as well do it and just at least see what we get. Wow, it's so calm. Yeah. Spot should be. There it goes. The data that we collected was both extraordinary and surprising. We were, um, we're, we're still trying to figure out what some of this data means, and that's a good thing. We, you know, we we introduced the idea of discovery, learning new things, and even though we didn't get to do it during broad daylight, it didn't matter to us. It was a success and we were ready to go on from there. There was a lot of talk about the weather balloon during Florence and Michael, and we almost had a few opportunities. But due to a few safety concerns, we decided not to. So yes, we missed out on those opportunities. It was painful, especially the incredible eye of Hurricane Michael at Category 5 in the middle of the day. You know, the way we look at it, we live to do it another day. This really got me to thinking, I have no clue about this weather balloon thing. I need to get some hands-on experience. So I told Mark, you know what? I'm willing to support a series of launches before the 2019 season, if that's something you're interested in doing. Uh, based on the sounding we launched here in Elk City, uh, shows fairly calm winds going up, so we should have a fairly smooth smooth ascent when we set the balloon up. Derek regularly works with smaller weather balloons to conduct what we call atmospheric soundings. That gives us an idea of how the atmosphere is behaving. And he sent up one such balloon as we started to get ready for the launch of Herbie. I was excited. I was finally going to be able to see this weather balloon in action. The most important aspect of this testing phase was to show Brent the ropes of how we inflate the balloon, how we get everything ready. But maybe more important than that is how we track the balloon once everything is in the atmosphere. And we do that through a spot locator, which is satellite based, as well as what we call APRS, which is an amateur radio system that sends a beacon out with data. Now that is Kerry's area of expertise. He had trained me in this for the last several years. The APRS will tell us its basic location, how high it's climbing, where it, uh, its final destination is in feet or meters, however we have it set. We're getting ready to launch Herbie test in Elk City, Oklahoma. What time is it? 2.48. 2.48 p.m. Central Time. This was an exciting moment. Testing is our opportunity to learn how to get things right and do so in a fairly stress-free environment because we know that during a hurricane, during that short period of the eye, things are going to be very stressful. I remember Mark letting go of the balloon. It goes up, and then it comes back down and does a bounce on the ground, and then back up. And I thought, this doesn't seem right. So I look over to Mark, and I see a calm but concerned look in his eyes that we may need to run and grab this thing before it gets tied up in those power lines. Uh 
utter disaster. I had miscalculated the amount of helium that was put into the balloon and just like it happened in Texas during our very first launch back in 2012, the payload was simply too heavy for the balloon to lift. Now luckily for us, Brent ran it down, the payload got snagged on a chain link fence, and we avoided complete catastrophe. We brought the balloon very carefully back to the truck. We added more helium. We all kept our cool. We solved the problem. We figured out what had happened and we kept going. That's what you do. You just keep moving forward. You learn from your mistakes and the rest of the day was extremely successful. I'll admit, my heart was racing. I mean, think about it. You got this small little box, a couple cameras, some weather sensors, and you're trying to send this thing to the edge of space? And this is just the beginning. So we pack up all of our gear, jump in the truck, Mark and Carrie basically pull out the low jack of weather balloons. I mean, Carrie starts yelling out altitude, speed, direction. I mean, we're gonna track this thing down. One of the most amazing things about this project is the fact that we can track this payload every moment of the way from the surface of the earth all the way up to the stratosphere using this amateur radio beacon that Carrie had trained me on called APRS. It sends a signal back every 60 seconds telling us all about the balloon's trajectory, its location, the temperature, the humidity, the pressure in the atmosphere, and this works all the way up to about 250,000 feet. Now we're trying to get the balloon to go up to about 100,000 feet, which we call burst altitude, and then the payload falls back to Earth via parachute and we go recover it. The APRS is our key once the payload is on the ground because we can pick that signal up using a handheld radio. The balloon's at 87,000 feet, <coughs> and um, it could burst any time now in the next five to ten minutes. Brent driving us west on Highway 152. We right. gotta get there. Yeah, we gotta get there. <laughs> it's up there somewhere. Finally, after seven years of doing this project, we achieved our 100,000 foot goal. The payload made it to over 100,000 feet. Now that was great, but something was happening that was very annoying to me. The GoPros were kind of freezing up. The batteries were running out of juice way too early, about 55 to 60 minutes into the flight, and that's not supposed to happen. They're probably just getting too old, those battery packs. And again, this was very, very annoying to me, and it was a problem that I was gonna have to solve going forward. Sorry, Derek. It's 551. 551 out in Oklahoma, and the payload's over there somewhere. We just gotta go get it. I don't see it yet, but it's over there. Spot locator picked it up. The radio's gonna pick it up. That's it, trying to talk to it. This is the radio that I keep mentioning. This recovery was quite easy. The spot locator, which again, that's satellite-based, told us exactly where the payload had landed, and then we used the APRS signal in our handheld radio to pinpoint where to send Brent, him being the new guy and all. We sent him out to pick it all up. Across the field, towards those trees right there to grab the payload. It should just be right over there. Well, we've had some interesting recoveries in the past. If we look at 2015 as an example, Carrie and Todd and myself all trekked through some pretty wild ranch land to pick up the payload there. Slow. 
spring a little bit. Just can't take any good sized branches out. All right, Brent recovered the payload and a good deal of the parachute. Yeah, it was hanging there. Wow. All right, so are the GoPros still running? This one, nothing. This one says full. But it doesn't. Interesting, okay. And then this one. It's just off. It's off. All right, well, we'll see what they got. So it, the payload was in the tree? No, it was right in that bush there. It was oh, it was a bush. Yeah, it was just oh, the okay. bush was about this high. Gotcha. Same as that stuff. So it probably hit and then dragged a little bit. But there was kind of an open area right there a little bit. All right. Recovery of that first payload was pretty simple. Mark and Carrie had it right on the money, and I was hooked. We had an extra balloon. We had extra helium. Derek mentions maybe some thunderstorms tomorrow. I told Mark we are definitely doing this again. All in all, this first test of the 2019 season was a success. I mean, it's always a success when you get the payload back. And to date, we are still 100%. We've never lost a payload. There were some weird things going on. We had some anomalies in the GPS data that we were trying to figure out. Also, as I mentioned, the GoPro cameras were not recording for the entire length. And these were problems that we could solve in the future. But for the most part, this first test, day one of this was completely successful. This is an area that we had been to before, Pratt, Kansas. We uh, launched here in 2016. Uh, Greg and Carrie and Todd came to help with that. And so we knew the area very well. And this is why I like the Great Plains so much to do our testing. The recovery process is a lot easier. You don't have the big population centers, the large forested areas like you do back east. And that is the most important part of this is the testing part. We know that it's going to be difficult during a hurricane situation. Let's make the testing part as easy as possible. You ready? Three, two, one, lift off. been driving around the last couple hours in the middle of nowhere tracking this balloon and Mark says hey the balloon should be right above our head now why don't you pull over and I'll see if I can spot it Whoa. sure enough he gets out spots it little white dot probably 15 miles up in the sky we all got to sit in the truck for about an hour and watch this little white dot that was probably the size of a house until it burst around 102,000 feet I mean, that was a really incredible thing to see. It was truly a benchmark moment for us. This project that we had undertaken over the past seven years had come a long way. And to be able to look up into the sky and see this little white dot sailing through the upper atmosphere, that was extremely special for all of us. Now we have scorpions and rattlesnakes to worry about and coyotes. Recovering that second payload wasn't as easy as the first. And it wasn't because Mark and Carrie didn't know where it was. They assured me the satellite locator and the APRS transmitter would lead us directly to it. All right, so what we're trying to do is fly his drone over there. We can tell it to go look where we think it is. And it did, but it's a big country out there. And without an access road close by, we were getting ready for a hike that turned into quite the adventure. All right, what's going on, Mark? <laughs> Go and hopefully pick up this payload. 1015. That's funny because it was 
about 10.02 when we got the thing from Mexico Beach. There it is. <laughs> Just give me a signal with your hand, the direction. So, straight that way. Yeah. Hear that? Hear what? Y'all walking toward the rental truck and still walking out. He scares me every time he does that. Kerry remained back at the truck and used his handheld radio to communicate with us from time to time, just checking in to see how we were doing. And I have to admit, I was uneasy about walking through this wild prairie land, the thicket that was out there. I mean, all it takes is one rattlesnake to make this a very memorable event on the bad side of things. Don't hear any dingoes. Yeah, so I'm going to go around this, around this thing so it don't go in. I know. That's why I'm hoping for this dry river bed. See, I'm thinking we go this way. It looks right. flatter than this thing. Brent says he thinks he sees it. Oh yeah. Wow. Woo! <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah, you get on the line, I'll video you. Wow. Don't disturb oh it. Oh my gosh. Documentation. Wow. Both GoPros are still there. One's broken off. So once again, the uh, tether. The zip tie saved it. Yep. You have to admit, this is really, really neat. We are purposefully launching a lunchbox size payload into the stratosphere via weather balloon and allowing it to come back to Earth completely uncontrolled. It's amazing that we can do this. Hey, Head west on white sand. You got it? No, it does it. What the heck? Gosh. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh. Sorry, guys. Oh man, really? Gotta, gotta get up. We just got comfortable. You guys are going to go through. He basically wants to cross over, and the guy says, I don't care. Rustling, herding cows with a truck. Let's not start a stampede. <laughs> <laughs> go, go, go. This is. Yeah, you never know what you're going to see on the Hurricane Highway when we're out there doing what we do. And we do see some pretty wild things from time to time. But you know what? This was another very successful event for us. And we were ready for whatever happened next. Um, it's amazing to watch these balloons be launched from the surface to the edge of space. It's not only exciting, but it's great for science. But at the same time, we have to be safe. And this is something we do take seriously. I got to spend a lot of time with Mark and Carrie over the last few missions. And I've realized how important it was to get Herbie into the eye of a hurricane. Of course, after these two test launches, I was hooked. And this has now become a top priority of mine. If I have anything to do with it, we will accomplish this goal. And it's going to be spectacular. The technology now exists where we can stream live video from, from the stratosphere, actually. It's just takes funding and, uh, and time, and I know that's where Mark wants to take this.